I'm Alexis Ohanian. I've started startups, invested in them, and met amazing people using the internet to change the world. Our generation has an opportunity unlike any other. We can create small empires without anyone's permission. Williamsburg, Brooklyn arguably one of the most popular neighborhoods in all of New York City. Now, there are plenty of people who live here and end up working at startups in the city. There aren't a ton of startups that are actually based out of Williamsburg. However, Rap Genius happens to be a company whose founders not only work, but also live right here in Brooklyn. Um, dude, it's been no, too... You know I don't do the bro grab. I thought we were hugging. No I thought we were bro hugging. Ah, uh, good to see you. You went for the bro grab. Yeah, that was definitely a hug. That was a hug. We have it on tape. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, they have no idea what we're saying right now. Really? In fact, the way that they're going to edit this, it's probably just going to be like dramatic music. Before we get any further, just want you to know I am an investor in rap genius. And all that means is I gave them money in exchange for equity because I think they were doing really awesome stuff. Um, the reason we're covering them today is because they're doing really awesome stuff. And I just wanted you to know that. Yo, you know rapgenius.com? Yeah. That's my website. Oh, well, That's yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, what's up? What's up, man? I would be on this shit all day. Look how many people were explaining it. Like all these different people were like debating that shit. That's and, like crazy. editing it and stuff. Dude, this shit is dope as fuck. Yeah. Funnel Goins inspired that line. Yeah, be egging edible. My mind creates my environment, creates my reality. When you smoke the seed, you kill off the root, and you don't allow it to grow. You heard it from the source, Rap Genius. The Rap Genius is a website, uh, really a group of websites devoted to close reading and analysis of text. So it obviously started with rap music. It's since expanded to all music and now really all of text. So if you have a poem that you're interested in or a song or a political speech, you go on the website and you see the words of the text, but then you can click certain words that are interesting and go behind the words and see what's the context, the analysis, the references, cute pics, links, etc. Welcome to our crib. All right. This All right. Is the so this is it. Huh? This is PH uh, Rap Genius HQ. We got the whole penthouse. This is actually a, uh, a converted uh, whiskey warehouse, and now it's just uh, Rap Genius Fantasyland, basically Wonderland Ranch. And this did not start as a business, right? That's right. Yeah, Rap Camera Genius was. Uh, yeah, well, it was just, you know, grew out of, uh, it was the sort of systemization and automation of a very manual process of listening to music with uh, my roommates at the time and getting it explained to me. And so I figured, well, if we could just take this and put it on the internet, teach the world about all this stuff that I was just, I was tripping off of, you know, because I never really listened to rap seriously, like from a lyrical perspective. And I was just, you know, Mapo Delon and Ariel, my other roommate at the time, were just explaining to me all the, like, the f***ing backstory, excuse me. Oh, can I say that? This, this is the verge. It's great. All the backstories and shit, you know, and other shit. <laughs> yeah. uh, all the backstories and, and references and stuff. And I was just blown away. And I just wanted to take that and put it on the internet and see what people would do with it. It just was a passion project for over a year, really, just toiling in obscurity, not really, you know, not really visible to most people. I mean, like, not really like a huge phenomenon, but also not really experiencing the pressure of trying to build a business. So it was good in that regard. Like, we were just having fun, really. And then. Uh, then we started to get serious when it, when it heated up like a year and a half after we started. You three all knew each other at Yale? Is that right? Actually, I knew Tom okay. and I knew Mapo. Mapo is my cool older friend and, uh, and Tom was my regular same age friend. So you were the link. I was the link. In many ways, it was like a bootstrap startup, but we weren't like, we're in the startup scene doing a startup. We were just like building a thing. So these are all uh, residences that you guys work out of? Well, it's kind of mixed use. We live here, we work here, uh, we have fun here. You know, it's maybe a little bit iffy, but you know, hopefully the Wiener administration will be as friendly to this kind of mixed use stuff as the Bloomberg administration. This is the product warehouse slash. This is where all the new product stuff is. Like, hopefully, we can find like a new feature and like play with it. This is Todd. Hey, Todd. Todd gonna go roll it out. We're big into foam roller. How many foam rollers do we have, Todd? Four. Four foam rollers. Bubble 2.0, you know? As a guy who, who absolutely adores Brooklyn, more of a South Brooklyn guy, but still, okay. why Brooklyn? 
Um, well, we lived in Brooklyn, you know, we've been living in Brooklyn for a while. We started Rap Genius, we, I guess we lived in the East Village, Tom and, huh. Tom and I. Yeah. And we moved to Brooklyn sort of when Rap Genius was in its infancy and we lived here. And then before we went out to Y Combinator, we were here, we still had our apartments, we had our lives here. And so after Y Combinator, we had to decide where we were gonna be. And uh, it just seemed to make the most sense, like where we wanted to live uh, more than anything else. This is the big board. This was where uh, when artists would come visit, they'd sign it, add a little personality. Uh, this big spit thing, this is Jean Grey, who sort of wrote, did the end of history and wrote spit all over it. Uh, Jean Grey, much love to Jean Grey. Rap Genius verified artist, brilliant musician. Am I allowed to tag this myself? Yeah, 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 write something on it, do it. Get this on camera. Just don't. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't. Up. Okay. Don't. All right. The whole thing. There we go. Oh, we're doing it! The meme! This is great. He's, he's a little bloodshot for some reason. Boom. We first launched the site, and it was uh, just like a bare bones thing. It was just you go to a page, and it would just spit out all the HTML that would make the thing. Like there was no like actual dynamic. Like you couldn't create an annotation using the site. You couldn't. It was just the site was just a way of storing a big blob of HTML. It spit on the page, and the JavaScript to wire it up so you could click. So it still had to click to see the explanation, but you couldn't do anything. You know, it was pretty simple, but it looked pretty good. Like, and it was called Rap Exegesis at the time. Uh, Very heady. Yeah, and yeah. that was something that people did not respond that well to. <laughs> we actually knew, we, we like had some feelings that it wasn't going to be great because like even in the first version of the site, we had like a pronunciation guide to exegesis. I don't know where if you, I could spell that. You could click on like a little like, one of those little like sound icons and it was Claire who still works here uh, saying like exegesis in a kind of like sultry voice. Exegesis. We worked on it, it was not a business, it was just a fun project. Tom and I had been doing some other businesses on the side to try to like quit our jobs. And you know, like we had bomb sheets, which is like a simple way to, yeah, you've bought bomb sheets? I've, I've heard, you know I've heard about great bomb things sheets. about it. Bombsheets.com, best way to buy bed sheets. Tom, Mappa, and I all had jobs at the time. Uh, we started Rad Genius. You had a proper job, right? And at I some did. point, you had to decide, no, I'm gonna leave that nice salary behind, like what was that, what was that thought process like? It was so hard, I mean, you know, it's just, you can talk about uh, and, and we even work on an idea a lot and get obsessed with it, but really truly saying, okay, goodbye, you know, I'm killing you, mom and dad and rabbi and society. Not literally, not literally. And stabbing you in the and giving it all, you know, it's, it's a big step. So we were kind of like, one, two, three, let's quit our jobs. And so I quit my job, but Tom being like a very good employee, I was like a mediocre employee. Uh, Tom being a very good employee was offered a job to stay on one day a week. You know, at the time I thought like, wow, like this is great because I get to work on Rap Genius four days a week and get some money on the side here and, and keep my life going. But in retrospect, I should have quit the whole thing. You know, I should have had the courage to really just, just go for it. I, I couldn't afford to really just totally quit my job and have no income. So I was uh, practicing hypnotherapist, which I was doing a couple days a week. And I had a few clients here and there. And so we were doing that in parallel to Rap Genius and just hustling. And we didn't know if it was a business. We didn't have a company incorporated. Uh, we were just working on it. And it was like our project. I remember I took a week off from work and built the whole uh, the whole thing where you could like actually sign up and highlight to explain and click and that was like the first big thing and then like that was sort of in the beginning how it worked like I would just like work in bursts on the weekend and, and uh, on the one hand I was the only one who could build the site but also the only one who could keep the site going and it's like I don't know that much about programming you know it's really the truth like especially in the beginning and, uh, and it was scary because like the site would go down and I wouldn't know what to do and everyone would be like okay Tom well you know what you're doing right and it's like <laughs> ah stack overflow I don't know yeah. Um, so it was scary, but it's also exciting, you know, like you can just build a thing and put it on the internet and when it works, people can just use it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do, it's crazy. It's great. It's magic. When people see founders interviewed, they always see the final product. They don't see the process to get there. And they don't realize that when we all get started, we don't have a clue what we're doing. The, the fact that like, <laughs> so the fact that all of a sudden you had started this thing and you felt Terrible, I presume, whenever the site goes down, all that stuff, two in the morning. Terrible is not even, it's just like, it's at a, it's at a more reptilian level. It's yeah. just like sweaty or whatever, like cold <laughs> and alone, yeah. you know? Well, so, so then what do you do? What, like, you really, you don't know how to solve this new problem you're confronted with. What, what the hell do you do? Well, I think the most important thing, whether the site's down or whether some investor is being weird or, or you're having a big fight with your co-founder and you're, you know, uh, whatever it is, the most important thing is just to think, okay, the world is not ending right now. Let me just take a deep breath and try to figure it out. And um, 
you know, that also, that still carries over to me now. Like the site goes down now and I can actually be like calm about it. Like, okay, it's not the end of the world, you know? And it just takes a certain amount of bad things happening in the world not ending for you to like chill and like take deep breath. And that's really important because it's easy to freak out, especially when you don't have the context for how much way worse stuff is gonna happen in the future to think, okay, this is it. This is the worst. Like, can we freak out? Let's do it. Should we do it? Let's freak out. Like that's kind of like the, it's easy to fall into that. But, um, but yeah, you just gotta be chill. It's hard. You know, you guys have stirred a hornet's nest recently with the success of your site. I, I, I really don't know what to make of your site, which is why you guys are here. Some people told me that I shouldn't have you guys on here because for some reason, just the mention of Rap Genius has been polarizing. Um, and I'll say this before I fully and, and, and officially uh, introduce you. When I was leaving my crib this, this, this evening on my way to the show, my 15-year-old son said, who's your guest on tonight's show? And I said, oh, Rap Genius, not, not thinking he would know who you guys are. And he's like, oh, that's the hip hop site for white people. Grayson Horowitz just announced that they've uh, invested $15 million into Rap Genius. Wow. That's right, that's $15 million in a site that does uh, annotation of lyrics. But believe it or not, these guys just raised $15 million from Andreessen Horowitz. Show me love! <laughs> Rap Genius is now a big, big company. It was just a bizarre experience to go from like, you know, the world doesn't care about you, doesn't care about your site, and you're kind of fine with that, and then it's basically the same site, and now people are starting to, you know, give you all this money, and uh, it was great. Obviously, Rap Genius, the, the hip hop section of it's doing extremely well. Great website. What is the strategy for getting people to be thinking about Rap Genius for the law as they do right now for a new Jay-Z song? It's tricky. I mean, it's hard to, to, to know how to attack the problem, you know, like what seems like attacking the problem uh, or it seems like just running around in circles might actually be attacked. So for example, with Rap Genius, you know, if we had set out from the beginning and we had said, okay, well, we are trying to uh, provide context for every piece of text ever written and for all new pieces of text and we're gonna start you know with rap lyrics and we just had no idea what we were doing we were just pursuing what was interesting and cool and I don't think you can lose that spirit just because now there's all these you know the difference with back then of course we didn't have a specific goal and we didn't have a ticking clock of money and, and, and whatever uh, but I think you can't lose that spirit you have to pursue what's interesting even if it's directly doesn't necessarily look like it's going to be uh, the thing that, that ultimately wins. Uh, right now we're going to the office where the sort of artist relations like pleasure dungeon basically. So this is where when someone's getting verified and is here to hang out and learn the site in a chill environment, 705. Have you rented the entire floor? Yeah, we got the floor. It's, you know, it's pretty chill. Just come out on the balcony here real quick. I mean, this is really, this is what it's about. Cause like what you gotta do is you gotta come out here and you look out on the city and you just think to yourself, we're gonna annotate all of this. Someday all of this will be annotated and it like inspires you, but also it humbles you. So we're just outside of Prospect Park and we're outside the home of a poet because the Rap Genius platform isn't just for rappers, right? You can annotate any text online. And this poet, just like thousands of others on Poetry Genius, uses Rap Genius to annotate his work. I'll never be comfortable saying so, but I'm a poet. I have been, I guess, publishing for maybe about 20 years now. I also teach. I'm about to stop, but um, you know. When did you make the fun, that sort of leap into, even though you hate saying it, being a full-time poet? Oh, well, I'm not sure anybody's ever really a full-time poet because uh, you just don't make any money. I mean, well, a few people are, but only a few, and there are thousands of poets. Um, but I started to become more comfortable saying I was a poet when I had uh, finally a, a book, <laughs> I guess, uh, you know. How did you first stumble upon Poetry Genius? Uh, and, and what was that experience like? I received an email from Austin Allen, who works for uh, Poetry Genius, who's the editor of Poetry Genius, and uh, he asked me if I would be interested maybe in, in annotating a poem, uh, becoming a verified uh, uh, artist on the site. And I said, yes, definitely. But the thing you have to understand is that the most um, respected poetry journals 
have about 30,000, uh, you know, a circulation of 30,000. Mm -hmm. So this was already, you know, from a selfish point of view, <laughs> you know, quadrupling <laughs> that, you know, uh, so I started to pay a, a lot of attention. So, uh, so walk me through what exactly it means to be a verified artist on Poetry Genius. What I would do is I would go in here and there is a very easy, you know, kind of like form, you know, form to put in, you know, upload your, your photo. So you were number one ranked with the 361 oh, okay. artists IQ. Oh, okay. Well, I was, I think I was the first one, actually, mm -hmm. um, the first verified artist for poetry mm -hmm. genius. So maybe that's why I was number one. I took enough lit classes mm -hmm. to sit through hours of professors and classroom discussions, sort of pontificating on what the artist must have thought must or have may have bullshit. felt. Or, yeah. yeah, and a lot yeah. of times it just seemed like, really? like. Yeah. Right. And, and so now, you know, my, my grandchildren are going to get to read your poem with your annotations. Well, that's the other good thing about this site. It's not just academics and scholars or, you know, that, or, or poets. It's anybody who wants to. And uh, probably often people have better bullshit meters than, you know, I mean, people, I should say people, as opposed to academics. <laughs> who are so, also yeah, people? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, to be fair, yeah. Um, so it sounds like some cracks in the ivory tower uh, oh, to come oh, because, oh, yeah. of, uh, because of Poetry Genius. Yeah. Two monitors, everyone gets two monitors. You weren't kidding with the magic cards. Uh, yeah, don't put that on the thing, it's super nerdy. Dude, it's cool. I actually played Spellfire which was the awkward, lame cousin to Magic the Gathering that Dungeons and Dragons basically ripped off. Here's another office. Oh, this I, is uh, here, oh, Chris is gonna freak out. Here is some rare shit, guys. Well, this just, is it, the new, I can't judge. Just for the verge. They can slow um, that down, they're gonna be able to Yeah, you're gonna have to slow that down. Gonna, so these are new drawings. This Chris would literally kill me. flip over this table if he knew you um, just did? Yeah, but he, Chris is a perfectionist, he's a genius, but he, you know, he stole design start, pen and paper, yeah, old I like fashioned that. way. Dude, Whatever. sure. I just, this, this right here, I finally read this. Uh, oh, just yeah. last week, great book. I've been Zach recommending Valley to everyone. Greenberg, Zod blog, brilliant oh. verified artist on Rap Genius, yeah. uh, hip hop historian, and there's verified excerpts up on the site, so yeah. once you read it, you go behind the text. Didn't Cheryl Sandberg do that for her book? That's true, the first chapter of Lean In is annotated by the community and also by Cheryl Sandberg herself. There's some good pictures from her honeymoon, inside deets from her time at Google, it's great. But what's so cool is Cheryl found out that a chapter of her book had been posted and was like, Cool. Let well, me she was into this. it. You know, I yeah. mean, that's what artists or, or and authors in particular. It's like you know, uh, it's it's very uh, uh, flattering and also kind of frightening to see your work dissected and you know. So the original the industry is like, whoa, what is good? Whoa, I'm intrigued. Whoa, you know. And so it takes like a little bit of, uh, you know, you've got to like. It's a, new, it's a new thing, you know? It's not like something you've seen before. So you gotta like zone in, figure it out. And Cheryl Sandberg immediately got it and did some great annotations. You know, 25 people right now and, you know, quote unquote managing, which really means how do you like address each person's humanity and their wants and their needs and all the stuff they bring to the workplace. I mean, it's pretty fun. Like, you know, all of the bad parts are, you know, self-inflicted because you like look at the thing and it's like your job okay, is that you can't be satisfied with the thing. And that's sad in a way, because it's a really good thing. It's great, it's a great website, right? I mean, give it up. You go, you, you see the annotations, website. you read. Yeah. And so it's a great website, but then it's like, okay, your job is you have to build it into something 100 times as big. And so every time you look at it, you're supposed to think, this is the early days of Rap Genius. This is the prototype of what it's gonna be. And you have to internalize that. It's not so much the highs and the lows, but it's just, you have to be in a mindset where you're pushing so hard to make things better that the existing status quo is gonna stress you out and that's like the general like uh, situation. But what's fun about it is you get to make the site that you think is cool. That's something that like, there's always just, the idea of it. it's crazy. I thought I was getting like a cheat code for the world. I wake up and I'm inside the whale and it's like, what are you doing inside the whale? It's like, well, there's no exit and I'm not really looking for the exit. So uh, we're just like, and it's an interesting whale. Like it's just, there's a lot to explore and uh, I never thought in a million years, like growing up or in college or even after college that I would like start and build a company. Like I just thought I'd be like a therapist or something. You were, you were at Google, yeah. right? Before yeah. leaving. So let's say there is someone at Google right now and you know, she's happy at Google. She likes the lunches and the snacks, but she really wants to build something. She yeah. actually wants to be you one day. So if you wanted to give her some practical advice, what would you tell her? 
I'd say quit your job. Like quit you, Google. Yeah, you gotta quit Google. Like yeah. you can't. You're sorry, just, Google. Yeah, sorry. Like I, I, you know, I, I had some good sashimi at Google for a couple of years, but I was like had some internal strife. Like, should I quit or should I stay? I mean, I'm getting paid and the people are nice, and there was a lot to you know. Um, recommend working at Google if you like it but if you're like I want to do something else like my recommendation is just like really don't wait it's gonna be hard you might fail you might fail for years you might fail for your entire life but even then you shouldn't keep working at Google like what is the point you know I just recommend to anyone that like whatever you feel like you want to do you have to just do it like today uh, even if it feels like all the circumstances aren't perfectly lined up, you don't have enough money, or you're not quite ready, or you don't think you have the time for it, I'm gonna wait till my parents move, like, you know, die or whatever. You could be doing that right. forever, looking right. at excuses. Yeah, 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 so I would say, you know, you're working at Google, you're not happy at Google, you wanna do something else, you gotta quit tomorrow. So what started as just a fun project between friends to decode Cameron lyrics is now disrupting academia. Right, we met with a poet today who's using it to engage with his fans like never before. And this is happening all across any discipline that involves the written word. Once you can put it online, once you can democratize access to it, as well as the access to understanding it, that's true power. That's a really, really big deal.